Dr. Power, Good. your guest of a ride. Thank you, Josh. He's very kind of you. Come on in, folks. Uh, Katie, a seat here. Kathy, uh, Blair, why don't you sit right there? Good. I'm glad you joined us uh, today as we go through this. Um, welcome to the second session. I hope you're having fun. Certainly, uh, it's interesting to me that the pace, the tempo is picking up on the discussion site. And uh, don't be overwhelmed. I just once again reinforce the need for two meaningful posts, all I expect from you to get embarked in this course. Uh, there'll be others that do far more because you're interested in a passion for the topic. I've had in the past some students who do as many 30 posts um, just because they enjoy the topic and want to have a bit of a dialogue back and forth. Use it, enjoy it, have fun with it. it, it's fine with me. But just for those that want to get through the course, two meaningful posts will get you what you need to do to uh, to meet my, my requirements to give you a, a passing grade in, the, in this particular course. Um, the uh, this week we go on to the toolbox, the little red toolbox. You have about 40 tools in there. I don't expect you to know them all in this particular course, but have a look, play with them, get a sense of what they look like, become familiar with the component parts of it. But the important ones I'm going to say to you would be, uh, and to most consultants starting out, would be the SWOT analysis. Most of you know that right now by the back of hand, but many haven't seen the TOES analysis that takes the data from the SWOT and migrates it over into a little matrix, and it's that data that from critical thinking comes out of those four little quads that leads us to action plans and strategies that we can take from the data that we've, we've gleaned. And having said that, keep in mind that that models don't make the decision for you, they simply inform your decision, but at the end of the day you make a decision to accept or reject the findings of the model. But they are good to take you by the hand and make sure you don't miss any steps along the way. So SWOT toes, um, I think the simple multi-attribute rating technique, the SMART model, is a very important one. Uh, whenever you have to make a decision between options, a decision criteria matrix between options, uh, the idea of market entry strategy, which country to select, which photocopy to select, which, which colleague to hire against key success factors and attributes that are important to you in making that decision down the left-hand side and weighted, and then do the extensions, helps you get there. There's a YouTube clip on this, but uh, it's also in the little black book. But I consider that an important tool that you should be quite familiar with before we get finished this course. Um, the uh, strategic group map arises out of the SMART model, um, which is important, little balloons and weights and strengths uh, against certain axes, and we'll talk about those that are in the tools. And then finally, maybe the Porter's Five Forces, know that one. In fact, that's almost a rite of passage for MBAs and dealing with other MBAs, is that you're familiar with Porter's Five Forces and know it like the back of your hand. The rest of them, Boston Matrix for portfolio analysis, etc. use them, play with them, uh, test drive them as you see fit. You have chances to do that in this course. I provided two context cases. Robinhood goes global in the next session, and uh, a session or so after that we do a uh, correction. Robinhood, and the one after that we do uh, Royal Rose goes global. Uh, just little context context cases. I don't mark them. I probably don't see a lot of your results, uh, but I want you to work with your teams, practice some tools, have conversations. In the Robinhood case about the need for strategy and strategic inflection points and things of that nature that we'll be talking about as we go through the sessions. And then railroads go global, some of the considerations entrepreneurs have to consider when taking their business from a home country to a host country, what are some of the things that go around in, in, uh, in the decision making process? Uh, very at a superficial level, not marked, not graded, it's simply for you to practice and at the end of each session uh, for those, I'll give you my thoughts uh, to have a look at to see how well you compared with yours and mine. No wrong or right answers. I may have missed things. You may come up with different tools I didn't use. So we'll do that. But where it's important to you is by practicing on those two practice cases is that you'll be doing um, on the final exam a, uh, a large case. And in there you have a chance to practice and demonstrate that you can do all these things. Um, let's deal now, if we can, with the uh, with the uh, with the deliverables. I like to just touch upon those, if I can. Assignment number one: I've asked you to go out there and find, in a particular industry, if you have one that I didn't list, it's important to you. I don't mind doing another one, but the uh, I've given you some suggested industries and sectors you can look at, whether it be hospital or retail or whatever. Um, go in there and find a particular article on the internet of everything, something that's current, cutting edge, um, something that leads to some so what's, what, imp 
implications that might have for society and for politics and for the economy, something in there that, that comes that arises out of it. So it's not enough just to cut and paste a story from the front page of the paper or the business section on the internet of everything, some new breakthrough. But I want to hear now the critical thinking. So that's your first slide out of 10 slides. The other nine slides should take me down in a 10-minute a PowerPoint presentation in class model as to what arises from that story? Tell me a bit about the, the, the actual story uh, so we fully understand it, all of our colleagues understand it. But then take me down the road and explain to me what are some of the so what's that will flow out of that? What changes will we make? Will people be laid off? Will retail states be laid down? Will it reduce the cost of hospital care in Canada? Um, take me through that and show me. Um, in this particular assignment, um, we certainly don't want to discard the importance of APA methods and things like that. but. At this point, I simply want the substance. I'm not overly concerned with the uh, with the form, and so as long as I have ten PowerPoints with the URL put in the slide somewhere, so I know where it comes from and I can check out and read it myself, that would be sufficient. Along with a one page, probably in a bullet point or narrative, those little speaking notes that you'd have. If I said do a ten point power uh, ten PowerPoint, you'd have a little speaking notes in front of you, and you're just referring a slide one, slide two, explaining to me a little bit more detail on what maybe is contained on the slide. That's all. It's only five marks. Um, no need to get carried away with it. It's a very simple, simple little exercise. The second assignment should build on that. That the topic you built, I would hope that you would have the foresight to take a topic that you can use that research into your second assignment where we start looking now into a 2,000 word paper that will pay attention to the APA with cover pages and tables of contents and executive summaries and references, appendixes. Appendixes don't count, by the way, towards the 2,000 words, where you will now have a good discussion in two parts. Uh, one is to talk about this particular internet of everything in your particular sector. You talk about maybe some examples, uh, five or six sort of innovative things that are happening. And then in the second part, of your paper, I want you to turn your mind to the dark side of what this internet of everything is going to do. The idea of data security and data privacy and data sovereignty and, and data censorship. I mean, today, just think what's happening with, with Google and Facebook and Twitter. They're censoring as we speak. They're, they're, they're taking the, the preferred, in their opinion, stories and putting them on the front and hiding down below stories that uh, disagree with their, their view of the world and how it should be. In some cases, in Twitter, they just simply take it right off and uh, don't, don't allow you to post. And uh, that seems to fly in the face of, of just fair play, that everybody's got a right to be heard. And uh, you may not agree with some people's statements, but certainly we have a right to say those statements, it seems to me. And uh, then we have a right to turn it off or not to listen. But increasingly, I've been becoming more and more concerned, as many are in the world and governments are in the world, with the increasing power, these, these monopolies, this oligarchy of, of public thought um, have over your decisions, my decisions, and the decision makers of countries, and to what extent should they be controlled? And it's not unusual. I mean, America broke up Standard Oil when it got too big. Ma Bell got broken up by the Americans when it got too big. Um, so when these things get too large, it, just good for competition to stimulate more competition is to balkanize them and break them up into smaller sizes where you may have an idea for a Twitter account and uh, rather than be edged out, give you a chance to fight and build up for competition and bring the price down. So uh, it's a concern. But anyway, that's the second assignment. I'm looking for some discussion around that as a, as a formal paper as you go through it. Um, what else is on my mind? Yeah, this week we covered the strategist perspective, just to get your mind set on dealing with strategy to break down some of the old mental models, identify some of the new mental models as we push forward. There are many, but these are just some to start you thinking that way. Hope you found some interesting challenges in there to uh, start thinking a little bit differently. Um, I, I posted, uh, in fact, today's Wednesday, I'm going to post it tonight when I go home or first thing tomorrow morning, um, the one on the stormtroopers. and. Uh, if you followed the instructions carefully and sort of put blinders on and focused your attention on the on the video itself and counted the stormtroopers and aimed for 19 or 20 or 21, I hope many of you did, but the point I'm trying to make is it was a shock and awe moment when you stood back for a few seconds and saw, when you played it the second time, the stormtrooper walked right across the screen and looked at us. 
And the point I'm trying to make with that is all too often, unless you go into your offices and close the door for 20 minutes, where you just kick back and do what we're doing today, just sit and look at the paper and draw some so what's out of it, you'll never transform yourself from the, from the administrator, the manager, into the leader of your organization without that move from data information knowledge into wisdom that I talk about in the, in the first slide. And so we have to be careful in life that we're, we're constantly on the lookout for these stormtroopers that are all around of us. Don't get so focused on the screen counting with the 19 widgets there, but zoom back out for a few minutes and ask why. That fourth man on the guns for the artillery, why? We need to do more of that. So that was the purpose of the, uh, the first uh, little session we had in the second session, play with some tools. And by the way, we've, there's about another 100 tools in the bonus section for those really interested, again, with some explanation about them. Um, unlikely to ever use them in your lifetime, but if you're getting into consultant, you might just wish to go to, go to find uh, some more tools. They're, they're there for you. Um, what else is on my mind? Um, yeah, I want to talk, if I can, then briefly about the uh, key thought rose out of this week's uh, uh, discussion sites, and that was that this trans this transition in, in how we manage and what we expect the competencies to be of our workforce, and certainly in the industrial age at the turn of the 19th century up to about 1970, most of what we did was teaching folks how to replicate, produce, bring costs down. Um, that was the way we treated our, our folks in from a management perspective. In fact, personnel managers were the big thing then, not human resource uh, directors, vice presidents, but they were personnel managers. They passed the turkeys out at Christmas. They helped some folks with some wills and some pensions, but they didn't have the role to play that has morphed in for HR folks today, where the HR people should be sitting at the boardroom tables helping with the decision plans. Um, but increasingly, that even has morphed further with the this new industrial age. It seems to me as we have moved from manufacturing into a service economy, about 80% of what Canada does, and with this internet of everything, how much more do we as individuals, that, that individual, we talked in fact in the strategy perspective of each individual can make a difference in your organization. Then the challenge is how do we measure that individual's contribution to our bottom line? Well, the same thing is here. That individual now with the internet of everything and the social media and coming into play, we need individuals that have different skills than they had in the industrial age. They need to analyze people quickly, as psycho uh, you know, psychological competencies. We need those sort of attributes that uh, weren't so important before. But today, that ability to read and be sensitive to and uh, motivate people is becoming increasingly important. And so we need to spend more time thinking about how we do that as one of the key thoughts that uh, came out. Another key, key thought that I've said for some time, in fact, I designed the course you're going to take, the last residency, the uh, uh, when you come in res two, it was a great thing. It's sort of a case analysis, uh, we bring a client in, shares the problems they have, and the whole session is nothing but you listening to some experts and designing and coming up as consultants, some, some solutions for them, as uh, can take away. But one of the people that I had in at that point was a very knowledgeable individual uh, from another institution who talked about analytics, Google Analytics, and how important it is that uh, all too often in in MBA programs and graduate programs we push away from the, from the quant side of the house. And uh, I'm telling you that increasingly in this new industrial age, uh, this new uh, internet age, internet age um, the importance of you picking up on the quants, whether it be marketing or, or uh, financial ratios or whether it be statistics, um, the importance to start bringing some of that hard skills back into every discipline. So I'd encourage you to look at the Google Analytics and come to understand that. I think that's important. Um, the other little thing I picked up on this week, and I, I think it's just coming through the fog, but the, the margins in the drug industry, in, in the, those pharmaceutical stores on the corner, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, and the corner little drug stores, et cetera, the margin on drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and the, uh, the, the prescription drugs is fat. The supply chain is fat. 
And Google's identified this, not Google, Amazon has identified this. And I think what we're going to see is starting to happen that Amazon, again, taking over the world, is going to make a big play, as they did in the food industry. They're out in front right now, and Walmart's trying to catch up. I think we'll see a similar game plan uh, come into the pharmaceutical side of the house, and every corner little drugstore is going to be under threat by uh, Amazon doing the same model they're doing for food, is uh, put your drug prescriptions in, they fill them and express them to you uh, faster than your corner store, at prices substantially lower. They're going to wring the pennies out of the value chain. And uh, that's going to cause a lot of disruption in the uh, in the pharmacy business. Well, folks, that's some more administrative detail I want to just clear. Um, and then we get underway now today. The, the interesting thing is one of the cohorts asked about success and how you can achieve that. And I just want to share with all of you uh, the four things I believe that will make you successful as individuals in your organizations as strategists is first is to read books. There's three things. Read books. Not just books in general, but books that are specific to your, your particular section that you're interested in. In my case, it's, it's strategy and it's international studies. So I read lots of books in those areas. And I know time is always an issue, and I want to be respectful of your time. But uh, if you just found 15 minutes a day, I always travel with a book in my bag, and if I have to stop somewhere, out comes the book to read those 15 minutes. And so 15 minutes times 30 gives you seven to eight hours in the run of a month, which is enough to, to read through these books that are coming out in your fields. So read those books. The second thing is to surround yourself with like-minded professionals, people also in that field. You can see places like Silicon Valley and why they're so successful, because they're breathing the same water, the same bathtub, talking about new books coming out in their field, and that leads to innovation uh, rather than go talk about completely different topics. But if you want to become good at what you do, spend some time talking to other professionals in your field and learning what the, the new emerging issues are coming through the fog. And the final thing is to set goals for yourself. Um, goals that uh, five years out, what you want to be. Your goal now is to finish this course. And anything that interferes and sucks the energy, uh, the resources away from you achieving your goals, prune the suckers. Get them off. And we talked about that as one of the tools in your little toolbox. So I wanted to share that. Now in the paper this week, interesting enough, um, as you know, Canada um, at one point was 84% of everything we produce, primarily in Ontario and Quebec, goes to the states and we're highly economically interdependent on America and America buying our goods. And uh, to our credit, we have decoupled down to about 70%, still far too overly dependent on one customer, but we're down to 70% and uh, we need to do some more decoupling. Uh, and so to that end, we see Canada shifts its focus on trade to China. But the interesting thing as we go into these trade talks is, is uh, this new no market clause in the new uh, uh, no NAFTA agreement, the, uh, um, hold on, I'll have that US, US uh, MC must control uh, America. Yeah, anyway, that, that new uh, NAFTA agreement, NAFTA 2. And so in there, that particular clause, um, although initially it gave absolute veto power to, to the Americans, uh, but uh, to our credit of our negotiators, they're e able to ease that back a little bit. But today, as a sovereign nation, we must run by for approvals, if not hard approvals, approvals uh, 90 days out and then another document 30 days out by the American counterparts to have them look at what our contract with China is going to be so they can give us some guidance as to whether or not we should accept it, move forward, or what their thoughts are on it. And as we'll see in a minute, sometimes they can be quite discouraging. And so... Uh, that's a good question today as we, we look at the, the aspect of sovereignty of Canada. There's, there's five steps towards political union. And the, you know, the, the EU is on the fourth step. And to the EU's credit, they've always announced the steps as they move along from the uh, uh, trade unions uh, straight through to where they are today. But in Canada's case, we've just sleepwalked quietly. Canadians have never had a discussion, but we're on stage step three right now of political union with America. We have our drug enforcement agencies, we have our militaries, we have NORAD, uh, we have a bunch of joint agreements, etc. And the strings and connections are getting tighter, and this is just one more under this, uh, this new uh, uh, trade agreement that, again, puts strings tighter and tighter on us, that uh, there may be a point we can't walk back out of that. And maybe what we have to do, and I'm just so poised this out for a discussion, um, maybe it's time for Canada to look at what's in our best interest 
20 years out. Uh, who should our partners be? Certainly in Canada's north, I don't think we can control the second largest land mass in the world. All the rare earths and water, 25% of the world's fresh water, oil, gas, rich lumber, we've got anything you want, we have it here in Canada. And there's only 34 million people, 35 million people, controlling the second largest land mass. China has cities that are bordering on 35 million people. And so is it reasonable to expect as the world runs out, like China's running out of water, uh, America runs out of certain commodities like water to, uh, to California, uh, at what point do the doors get kicked in and they take what they need? We already see that happening on Canada's north. The sovereignty in Canada's north is being chipped away at by a lot of countries, including the Americans and the Chinese, etc., on our, those three passageways up there in our particular Northwest Passage as the ice melts. And China has deemed it in their national security interest uh, to have free, and free access through those channels to its market in Europe. And uh, they've got the, the muscle to back it up and the icebreakers to back it up. And Canada doesn't. We've got just under 5,000 rangers up there with the 303 Lee Enfield rifles. And I don't make fun of those because they're the ones you need. They don't freeze with a round up the spout in the ice. You can fire the first round and it breaks the seal and you can use them. But that's basically what we have. Every year we have the Canadian government goes up there. The Prime Minister gets a picture taken. They promise all sorts of things. And that sort of peters out till the next year photo op takes place. And so we're really underinsured when it comes to Canada's north. Unlike the Russians who dropped the titanium Russian flag in the North Pole and have put the troops up there and uh, uh, something in the order of uh, 14 icebreakers, uh, they've got the muscle to enforce their channel, and they do enforce it. If the Chinese go through there, they pay for an escort by the Russians to take them from one side to the other. Um, we don't. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But back to this idea of trade with, with China, that we have President Xi, we talked a bit about him last last uh, week, and he's taken control of China, much like Mao Zedong did at the time we talked about the Cultural Revolution, the third one in 1966. Um, and uh, he's very much turning into a, a very strong-willed, uh, I say dictatorial leader. Uh, he's getting that sort of power. He's, uh, he's taking it all from the uh, from the ruling class over there. And uh, I mean, he took Interpol's uh, chief, and simply, uh, much like the Turkish situation, just snatched him and he's now somewhere in China being uh, cross-examined uh, for uh, some of his positions as we do this. And so we have to look closely at this. Certainly China, we talked about the Silk and Belt Road last last week and a great infrastructure and gold versus chess. But my concern for, and I think I'd like to do this as strategists during these next few weeks, let's look for the fissures in China. What might go wrong in China? And certainly one thing that can go wrong and is going wrong is that they're draining down their, their cash reserves to the tune of about $100 billion a month. Uh, they're, they're in the hole. And a lot of that comes in large part from these new initiatives that they're actually loaning money out to these countries to build infrastructure and ports, but these countries aren't paying them back. And so they're carrying them on the, on the books as full and good, good loans. But the reality is that uh, they can't pay them back. And as a result, their, their financial statements are... Uh, are full of holes and not as strong as they make out to be. And uh, against that background, Trump is negotiating and we should be watching for what's going on with that. We talked a few minutes ago about this and how Trudeau defends Huawei's policy, the, uh, um, the uh, network uh, Chinese provider for 5G um, networking systems. Um, but uh, Marco Rubio, the American Democratic se Senator, and uh, Mark Warner, also a senator who sit on their uh, 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 intelligence uh, committees down below. The words are, have warned Canada that we should not go through with this deal with the Chinese uh, uh, supplier of, of, of chips um, because uh, it could be dangerous to the national security. And again, this interdependence with America, the question becomes that if we, if we go and do this business with China and buy the Chinese chips, to what extent will that impede the flow of information or business back and forth with the Americans, which is 70% of what we do. And if you peel the onion for a few minutes and ask why, it may well be that the Americans want us to buy their 5G chips out of Texas and places like this. And so there's a lot going on here we need to, need to look at, but there's also this sense of polarization of recent date between our Prime Minister and Donald Trump. Uh, there clearly is no great love loss between the two. Uh, we have Plato and Aristotle clashing before our eyes, and uh, at the end of the day, who gets hurt by that? And so we could, there's a bunch of topics in there we could have a look at. Um, certainly this uh, murder in, 
in uh, the embassy in, in Turkey is still on the pages, um, and it, it can't be can't be solved easily, but there's all sorts of balls of play. Some aren't mentioned in the media, but we talked about vehicle currency. That's absolutely critical. If, if, if the Saudis do not take uh, American dollars for their oil and go to some other method of payment, that's a complete disaster for the vehicle currency and a complete disaster for the world and a major recession. And that's what we're playing at right now, but it's not being talked about. Uh, we certainly have oil is a big issue and oil supplies and oil pricing and up, down, that uh, is some in play. We have the whole security of the Middle East that we talked last week about the Saudis versus Iran, the Shia versus Sunni. Um, that's at play and the Saudis right now very much are uh, working on Yemen and driving the Iranians back out of that area for command and control. Uh, the Saudis for the, for the first time in recent years are getting along well with Israel uh, which is unusual but they're becoming compatible and if we were to disrupt that arrangement what would happen to that vacuum there as Russia and China are anxiously licking their chops to get back into that area so we watch for that. The U.S. debt, understand that the U.S. debt is held in large part by uh, not that it's the Chinese but a, a substantial portions is owned by the Saudis as are a lot of assets in the states and so uh, we've got to find some way in there for I think for them to save face and I suspect, keep in mind I'm making this on Tuesday, you won't see it till next Monday, but I suspect uh, Pompeo is over there right now having a discussion as to what the, the story is going to be. Uh, is it going to be said that the King uh, uh, Suleiman over there knew or ought to have known what was taking place? Or can we put a, uh, a, a wall up and he was not aware of this taking place, but the facts are clear. Um, the individual went in, the individual was murdered, they found evidence, uh, uh, the Turkish government of, of the... Uh, of the murder actually taking place there, and this seems to be a frolic of their own by some folks under control, and I guess that story uh, may or may not wash, but that may be the story that comes back the time we read this, watch this, as to save face and allow all these other balls in the air we just talked about uh, not to be too disruptive. Uh, but certainly they'll have to find some sanctions to uh, satisfy the cry to, uh, to do something about this uh, Wall uh, uh, Washington Post uh, journalist and his family. I mean, his family deserves some of our thoughts and, uh, and prayers at times. It must be very difficult for them. And it shows a picture of the cleaners coming out of the, the building. This caught my eye, just a neat little passage. Charlotte Bronte, uh, Jane Eyre, 171 years ago, wrote, wrote the book, um, um, Jane Eyre. And, uh, but the passage caught my eye. Uh, she's supposed to be a Victorian man at this time, almost 200 years ago, but she makes the claim, I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I'm a free human being with an independent will. And that's quite a neat passage. I think even a man in those days would have difficulty getting by with that. But she wrote under a male pseudonym, so she, she put it in, but it's quite, quite an Orwellian thought when we live today that uh, I don't think any of us can say that I am no bird, uh, no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will. I think we're all being chained these days. In fact, it was... Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that uh, man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. And from the day we're born, we're getting layers and layers of chains of things we can't do and taxations and the uh, Patriot Act and the uh, Canada's Anti-Terrorism Act and the regulations just keep piling up on us and these chains are encumbering us so it's, it's almost getting hard to breathe at times. But this was an interesting passage of her sense of freedom for individuals 171 years ago. There's a picture in here about the uh, move towards unification of the two Koreas and the idea of putting a, a train line between Seoul and Pyongyang uh, in place. Um, a good idea. Certainly it would be most welcome in North Korea to have that sort of monies being expended and new train lines putting up. As you can imagine the infrastructure in North Korea and the state that it's in, this would be a most welcome addition. And so uh, a carrot is being offered and proposed at this committee about building something like that uh, and that would be of interest. And that train line could go on, of course, for straight into China and over to Russia. So uh, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a valuable trinket that I think they might be interested in having. But certainly in Canada, we had the same trinkets offered to us in British Columbia. We said we'd not join Confederation uh, if they couldn't put a, uh, an iron belt across Canada right out to BC, a train so that the flow would be east-west, not north-south. And uh, to their credit, they put it in and uh, BC joined Canada. Um, this is a 
a scary story. I mean, on his face, it's just a symptom of the, of the larger problem. But here we have a former army captain, Canadian army captain, who's detained by the American uh, uh, system, has been sitting in jail for 75 days. And he was a captain in the Canadian artillery. Um, he was, uh, this, he's now, he's 50, he's now 47, now 47. Um, and uh, he served side by side with the Americans in Afghanistan. He worked for the CIA as part of that tasking in Afghanistan. He had top secret clearance working in Afghanistan. Uh, but he made the mistake recently, having got married to an American lady, to go down and apply for a motor vehicle and cross the border to get a motor vehicle permit. Um, and uh, they picked him up at the border. And the reason they picked him up is back when he was uh, 23 years old, um, he trafficked in drugs. I think it was $80 worth and received six months. It was a, a, a pretty strict draconian system in Canada in those days. Many youngsters were careers were ruined trying to get into university and things. And he got one month at the local farm, uh, was his sentence. Uh, and then he got the Queen's pardon, which theoretically removes all records of it. And here we are 20, 25 years later, somehow the Americans going through can pop up on their computers, his background, and they said, you're a drug trafficker, 80 bucks worth. And so they uh, are holding him going through all that, and he still hasn't been released yet. But it, 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 that's, the, that's the symptom. But at a much larger, this dark side of the Internet and the data sovereignty we talk about, to what extent is all your data being collected in repository in America, that when you cross the border, everything about you is known by the Americans? And do you want that? And so if this new zero-tolerance policy of Trump uh, at the border is, uh, in the light of this, this legalization of marijuana in Canada, is going to be fraught with dangers. I mean, you're going to need policies first within your organizations. Royal Rose just put one out last week, uh, the policy for <laughs> to what extent we can puff on, on pot and come to work with pot. Um, but the same thing here for, for you folks, for your organizations. But the, the Americans are going to have this zero tolerance at the border, and uh, we do a lot of traffic back and forth over the border. And uh, we're going to have to watch that. There's going to be a lot more of this going on because we don't have this this alignment between the two uh, the two countries. Um, what else have we got here? Okay. Lots to talk about today, but I'll be respectful of your time. I'll go for the 35 minutes and hold it there. Uh, racism. Um, yeah, here's a big article in the report on business, and we saw what we've been talking about in, in here, but Ottawa has just released a report, and we've been talking now about four years, that more than one million jobs could be lost in the coming boom of automated vehicles. One million jobs in Canada, that's a big number. Um, it comes from the Employment and Social Development in Canada. They've done some looking at this job, and in a 2017 presentation, they predicted it could kill 500,000 transportation jobs from truck drivers to subway operators to taxi drivers and courier services, and another 600,000 uh, in such jobs as parking attendants, auto body workers, uh, police, and even emergency personnel. So that's quite a number removed from the system. Um, and then they talk in terms of the skills, and the, the government is putting in $1.8 billion over the next six years to pay for some expanded skills training to retool these people, because today, if you don't do this lifelong learning, if you don't retool, um, you're for the garbage heap. Montreal textile workers at age 47 who find their jobs going out to 3D printing and uh, robotics and uh, globalization, taking the jobs from there to the Macadoria area, say in Mexico, um, now find themselves at 47. What do they do? They have to go back and retool. And if they don't retool, they're for the garbage heap. And we're going to see more of what I talk about here in a few minutes. And so it's a challenge. And then the idea of this, this new skills education, I, I wonder whether they have a sense of where the puck is going to be. It was Gretzky said, don't skate where the puck is now, skate where the puck is going to be. And uh, this new $1.8 billion, I do hope it is focusing on the 20% of where those jobs are going to be, not just more of the same life skills, et cetera, about getting up in a bed in the morning and shaving and spend money on that. Um, but we better start training people some hard, competent skills that they're going to need. And we're going to talk about those where those jobs are in this course, because we need to do that and train our people for that. Because there's 1.1 million people out of a small workforce in Canada, 34 million. Um, you can do the numbers, I suppose, with 10, 11 million people work. Uh, that's about a 10% hit uh, for unemployment. 
And so we do. In fact, it raises the question for us in discussion, to what extent is the trajectory between what university teaches and what you folks in industry want? I think the trajectory is getting farther apart. In fact, I've served on three national uh, conferences, one on oil and gas, one on health care, and the other was on uh, banking. And every one of those, the studies show that, in fact, one banker came up and said, uh, Terry, the BCom students you release and send out of here, it takes us six months to teach them what we have to teach them before they can give back to the bank. Um, and that's this misalignment between what we're delivering and what's coming out. In fact, uh, a lot of you folks are, are, are like sausages. We, <laughs> we put you through the system and out the other side, but we've got to make sure that the, the mix of the sausage is the right mix, that you get a job when you come out of this thing, that the skills that you're acquiring uh, have a place in the workforce in this new industrial age. And so we need more involvement by government and more involvement by the community and by businesses in helping us design our curriculum. I mean, what say do you folks have as customers in my curriculum that I, I'm delivering? And so we've got to get that alignment down. I think in this particular course, I think we're getting pretty close to what you're going to need when you get out there, and I hope we're on target for that. But we have a discussion this week about are the institutions delivering um, applied and practical, valuable tools for this new industrial age that we're going into? Um, certainly a, a topic for discussion. Um, Canada's Arctic is being threatened by PCBs and mercury, uh, new chemicals emerge. We have this clash, we talked about the clash of civilization. Huntington talked about it in his paper in, in 1994, and he projected, uh, forecasted that the, the next big war would be not between uh, necessarily countries, but between uh, uh, civilizations, between Muslims and Christians, and wrote about it uh, to some extent. And it's, it's turned out that we have this clash going on um, between the two um, visions of, of what the uh, religion and world should look like. Um, well, the same clash is going on in Canada's north. We have up there our indigenous people who have lived for millennials up there quite comfortably and quietly. Um, and all of a sudden, because of the oil and gas and melting of the passageway, um, it's becoming a very attractive country. It's like the old west. So we have oil companies and gas companies and others going up there in great, great droves without the infrastructure and the rules and regulations and the people put the sanctions and to enforce it in place. And as a result, it's, it's getting polluted. It, it's getting destroyed up there. And so uh, the question for us is, uh, we talked a bit about Canada's Arctic sovereignty and it's under attack right now and what we should be doing. And uh, we're clearly not doing enough. Um, I see the American West Coast military bases are being eyed out for energy exports. They have places in uh, Alaska and uh, all the way down the coast. And so uh, to get their product over to China, places that need gas and one thing or another, they're using the reserves uh, space that they have for the uh, military as uh, launching places. Certainly Sears Chapter 11 was of interest. Uh, we've talked a bit about that. Of what can go wrong if you don't if you don't scan the horizon for what's coming through the fog and don't tool. Um, article about Ireland and Brexit and there are six MPs in the party in Northern Ireland that very much are supporting May, the British Prime Minister, as she deals and uh, they've got some strong rules. They don't want to see a hard border between Northern and South Ireland and uh, and uh, the European Union says there will be a hard border between all non-members. And so we have this clash coming up. They're trying to find a way around. And uh, we're getting close. We're six months away from this thing, sort of some sort of sense of wrapping it up. And uh, the whole European Union is, is in a difficult position right now. I mean, Brexit is a big issue, and, and, and uh, Britain leaving is a, is a major component of that, that cluster. But um, Italy and Greece, um, Spain, um, Portugal, um, and even Germany to a lesser extent now, uh, certainly France, they're all struggling economically. Um, it's not good times necessarily over there right now, uh, as is I said that uh, Chinese are doing the same thing. Um, there's much in here to uh, consider. I think that's it from that piece. Let's see what else I got here. Well, you yeah, know, this is part of this idea, the, the, this large unemployment wave coming at us. The front page of the paper here talks about a $100,000 bill for repairs after protesters who occupied Nanaimo School. 
we have in BC, particularly where it's a warmer climate and the winter's coming, droves of people are coming here and they're setting up little, spring up little camps, little tents, tarps, sleeping areas of 30, 40, 50, 200 people um, in these little clusters around the countryside. And they get to stay there for about 10 days before the government comes in and gives them an eviction notice and they move down the street and do it all again. And the numbers are getting bigger. And every time they do it, there's repairs because there's needles, there's no proper pollution, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, one holders there for, for them to use. And so uh, there's repair bills. And this time they used a school. It was a $100,000 repair bill for an empty school that they decided to occupy for two weeks. And the week before that, it was down here by Uplands, uh, one of the shopping malls. That was a much larger bill as you go through it. Um, uh, Whistler is grappling with worker housing crunch. They haven't got housing up there. People are sleeping in their cars, but uh, to work. And so uh, what is it for a Canadian to have to sleep in his car or her car to work and wait on the table up in Whistler for rich tourists to come in and use? How does it make you feel as a Canadian? And that leads us to the question today of the $15 an hour wage. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes, uh, how you feel about that. But we have a duty. Uh, you folks have a duty. You're the directing minds. You're the folks taking over this world. Um, what are you going to do with this mass of people that's growing now that needs housing accommodation? Um, we just can't let the tent cities grow because it'll come to a certain tipping point, um, certainly during the uh, Depression, at 25%. Uh, unemployment, it gets pretty serious in any nation. And so we're a long way from that. We're looking rather good right now for employment, largely based because America is doing so well. But uh, if that was to crumble on uh, the 6th of 7th of November, um, life can look much differently on the on the 8th. Um, CBC is interesting. The CBC, um, established in the 30s, there was a need there for unity, like the railway I talked about, to put Canada together. We needed the CBC for places that didn't have radio service and news and get that sense of community of Canada. And the CBC performed a wonderful function. Uh, that was 80 years ago. Um, but today, with the radio, television, print media, uh, online, uh, 5G's coming our way, which will improve the service for all, the question becomes, do we still need the CBC? We spend, out of your tight budget, $1.8 billion annually, we give them as part of their budget. $1.8 billion. And we've got people sleeping on the streets uh, for the CBC. And on top of that, they put their own ads and one thing or another and collect revenues. And so we're basically taking tax money, $1.8 billion, giving it to the CBC so they can compete with the people paying the taxes. Global Television and all these other people. And so. To what has the time come? I guess my question is: Do we still need the CBC, or could that 1.8 billion dollars be better used? Certainly, the people up north, the people in uh, northern BC, the people on the border, have access to, uh, I suspect, all the media that they need. And uh, there may be a special program or two you like, which could migrate over to a regular station. But do we need to give uh, a 1.8 federal grant each year to the CBC? A good question. Um, tariffs. Are tariffs hurting Americans? And so the, the idea of tariffs, there are occasions when tariffs are warranted. warranted. Um, right now, the Americans want to tariff on our steel and, uh, and uh, iron supplies, steel and aluminum, and, uh, and the grounds are national security interests. Well, national security interests is a valid. The, w World, the World Trade Organization lists five conditions that generally they'll accept tariffs, saying that's reasonable in the, in the circumstances. And national security interest is one. And uh, where it was played out uh, a few decades ago was uh, some of the best rice in the world comes from California. Uh, Americans tried to ship it into Japan. Japan said, thanks, but no thanks. We'll have our own rice made in Japan. While not as good as the American rice, it's the rice we're going to use. And their argument was, in national security reasons, as they found in the last World War, if for some reason they can't get rice from California because things have turned sour, the country starves. And the last war helped precipitate bringing to a head in Pearl Harbor is, is that uh, the sanctions cutting down the oil supply on them so tight that they had little choice either to fight or to give up prior to, uh, to uh, Pearl Harbor because there was the amount of oil flowing in 
it was like 90 days supply and then that was it they were out of out of energy and so uh, the question is here are these tariffs by the americans truly national security interests on a country like canada uh, i think canada has proven has proven i mean i talked about afghanistan a few minutes ago um in canada we have something called the princess patricia uh, light infantry uh, ppcli and uh, a great regular force unit uh, that has the presidential citation. It's, it's something given in very few cases, and particularly to an external force, a little blue patch with a gold thing around it. And the first battalion that got off when we joined the Americans in Afghanistan was the second battalion of the PCLI that had this presidential citation on. And that was an eye-opener for the Americans because they could only dream about their units having one of those. And here was an American organization. My point is I think Canada has paid its dues uh, through a number of wars uh, to show that we're a pretty solid ally and not much to worry about for national security reasons. But nevertheless, Trump is saying, national security, we're going to put tariffs on your aluminum. And so, again, it gives cause, gives cause for reasons for us to uh, want to move quickly about decoupling and consider, um, given the size of Canada, uh, should we be a junior partner? Should we give up? I started talking earlier about this, the idea of finding a, a senior partner to protect us, to make sure that when the time comes, um, we don't have to get uh, run over by somebody who wants water or somebody who wants passageways, but we should look at our options. And that includes China, that includes Russia, it includes the Commonwealth of Great Britain, who's now being freed up from the European Union. Maybe it's time for that cluster of folks to come together as one solid trading unit and, uh, and protect each other in a, in a NATO-like organization. And maybe it should be America. I've got no hostility to America. I'm just saying we, we should decide this right now, uh, going through a proper cost-benefit analysis as to uh, who do you want to partner with. In fact, one of the things I asked my class, um, BCOM class a while back, was, uh, and there's different mental models. Most of you folks are a little older, and you probably grew up the sense that you'd marry the girl next door and stay in the same community. Uh, the younger ones don't. They haven't got that mindset they're leaving. So I asked to become, if we gave each one of you a million dollars, would you sign a quick claim deed, basically sign off whatever interest you have in Canada, and uh, sign it over, and get an American citizenship? So America basically comes in and gives 34 million Canadians a million dollars, and in return for that, Canada becomes three new states, whatever it's going to be, a part of America. And uh, we've got a bunch of Canadian millionaires up here with American citizenship. All the hands went up, ready to go. And so it, the times are changing. And they're, they're prepared to travel. They're, they're global citizens. Um, anyway, so those good questions. Um, what else is on the line? Well, I'll put that one down. Just one or two more, I think, and I'll call it a day. Electricity shortfall in Ontario. The Conservative government have come in there and have closed down um, 758 renewable projects that they had planned to help reduce the need for electricity. And they're going back into the, the old metal models of what they need for energy. And as a result of that, they're going to be short on the energy supply as we do it. And so the question becomes uh, electricity and the alternative energies that are available and the idea of fusion out there, and look at fusion, uh, France is moving quickly in that. 80% of, of the energy in France is all is nuclear. These folks are closing down the nuclear power station at Pickering um, and going with other models, but not the alternative energy models as we do it. But I often wonder, like in, in, in BC, we have the Site C Dam project. It's $10.5 billion to flood farmlands and produce uh, hydroelectricity, which is good in itself but primarily to export it to California uh, to provide them energy they need for their air conditioners in the summer like they need water. And, uh, but our bills, because this, and we talk about maybe next week about this, are getting dramatically high out here for energy, and I'm not sure we need it. And certainly if you took $10.5 billion on the, there's only 4 million people in, 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 in all of Vancouver, the major city, um, I think you could, you'd have every house in BC, solar power paneled uh, with uh, suitable batteries coming out of uh, Tesla um, and never have to worry about uh, putting in those uh, things that destroy fishes. The same thing with TransCanada pipelines. I don't think you're going to recover the capital costs um, of those pipelines um, 
with alternative energy just crashing our way. But it's good for a discussion. Um, appreciate the, a lot of folks in the class with the skill sets to talk about the energy field and uh, what's coming, but certainly repositioning is necessary in the light of what's happening. I think, folks, in respect for your time, there's more stuff here to do today, but that's a pretty good session. Folks, I'm enjoying it. I hope you're enjoying it, too. And call me if you need any questions along the way. And sign up for your projects. Um, here's your need me. Bye-bye.